So now I'd like to turn it over to Tabitha Beal, the Environmental Lands Manager with Polk County Board of County Commissioners, with her lovely topic about macroinvertebrates and how they relate to water quality. So thank you, Tabitha, and best wishes. <laughs> thank you, Shannon. Thank you guys both for inviting me to come on today. Um, this is a really cool topic that um, I'm getting to share with you guys is bugs that rock and also the importance of them when it relates to water quality and health of our wetlands. So before we want to get started, this is a really cool aerial of photograph of our Banana Creek Marsh, better known as the Circle B Bar Reserve Wetland System. Now, you've probably heard of many ways to be able to determine water quality. Um, we can do a lot of sampling with high-tech equipment um, and analyzers that we stick in the water. We can collect water quality, have it sent off to a lab. There's lots of different ways to do it, but we may not have been realized that we can also test the water quality is by looking at the distribution, the number of taxa, the different kinds of species of macroinvertebrates that live in the water. And even some species are indicators of good or poor water quality. Um, but to take a step back, I wanted to talk about wetlands in general and why we should care about our wetland health. This system it, in the past would have been viewed as a unusable landscape because it's wet. And so through our time, humans really went through the process of draining a lot of our wetlands. As you can see in the center of this photograph, some remnants of some ditching and draining that went through the marsh here. But over time, we've come to realize that water is a limited resource and we need to be able to treat our water resources on site and protect it. This reserve, it's about 400 acres in wetland, is protecting not only our neighbors from flood protection, it's improving the water quality that moves through and into the Lake Hancock, but it provides a refuge for numerous animals to have a place to call home, a nursery to raise their young, and also a migratory stopover. So wetlands have really transitioned over the years of the importance to us as humans. Now, our role in protecting these wetlands are not limited to just large corporations, um, point source pollution, but non-point source pollution is the number one. And some are typical ones of those are like pet waste, stormwater runoff, increase in sedimentation, um, Fertilizing your yard, even your yards at home, increase too much fertilizer can really overwhelm a wetland system and pollute it. So just overall, the health of our wetlands is very important. You can't always tell the health of a wetland by looking at it. You can't always tell that it's been concreted in, as this picture has. Sometimes they look very natural. So a closer look, look is warranted. And one of the ways we do that is through macroinvertebrates. Oh, and look, we already have a poll question to come up for the day. So we're gonna put that poll question out there for you guys. Which of the following may cause a decline in the diversity or taxa, um, which then means the different species of macroinvertebrates, or a decline in water quality of a stream or wetland? We may also refer to these as environmental stressor or pollutants. And for this one, check all that apply. We really need Jeopardy music at this point. All right, we have a couple more seconds for the last. Excellent, all right. Terrific. Well, for those of you that selected multiple causes, you are correct. Actually, everything contributes to the decline in our wallet or quality from our dog waste, sewage, and fertilizer, except for noise pollution. Believe it or not, noise pollution does not hurt the water quality. Um, now, it may affect the wildlife living in the wetlands, but it does not directly affect the water quality itself. So, great job, everybody. All right, so why we study macroinvertebrates, this is just a really great, this actually comes in poster form. Um, and it just shows you how rich the water is underneath where we're typically looking. A lot of people take that for granted. Um, we see the beautiful birds, the alligators, the reptiles, but we forget the bottom of the food chain are a huge part of the process. And so everything from dragonfly nymphs to crayfish to small freshwater shrimp, uh, to stoneflies to mayflies, you see them here illustrated in this. And we're gonna be talking about them because their numbers 
or the diversity of their numbers, and then also certain species can tell us when the water quality is good or poor. And we'll advance here. There we go. Uh, because we cannot rely on the fish to hop out of the water and put out in the newspaper that pollution is in the air. So this is a really great indicator of how to track your own water health and quality of the wetlands in your own area without having to pay the high cost of sending water off to a lab. So we're talking about benthope macroinvertebrates and to break that down, the benthope part means bottom. They live typically at the bottom um, and on the bottom of plants. And then macro means large. So you don't need a microscope um, to look through these. Just a small magnifying glass. Most of them can see, be seen very easily with the naked eye. Um, the invertebrate part is important because that means they have no backbone and they make great indicators of watershed health. Now I wanted to take a minute to talk about who are these macroinvertebrates and where do they come from? And at this point, I want to point out the life cycles. We're, everyone is taught from very early on. We have the simple life cycle like the alligator. We also have the complete metamorphosis such as the um, moths or butterflies. But there are a number of these aquatic macroinvertebrates that go through incomplete metamorphosis where they have an adult terrestrial stage and then they have a nymph aquatic stage and the adults lay their eggs in the water. And we're going to talk about a little bit of those. Some of them, such as the predaceous diving beetle, which is the adult that you see in the lower right of your screen, are aquatic in their adult stage and in their larva stage. So with this, we actually have several um, larva stages at the top. The top left one is the predaceous diving beetle. And he gets his name because he is a ferocious eater of other aquatic organisms. And you see those large pinchers at the top. He goes around eating everything. He'll, we've even witnessed them eating tadpoles before in our um, dip nets. Um, this gives you a little glimpse of what we're talking about when we talk about the dip net, the young gentleman on the side. So dip netting, what is that? And what is the process of sampling these? And these are the basic tools. Like I said, you can do this easily, fairly inexpensively at your local water's edge like we have set up here. Really all you need is a pan, a tray, such as the white one here, to be able to put the aquatic organisms in. We do stress that these are live organisms and they require water since they're aquatic. So you wanna make sure there's plenty of water in the pan. Um, a good net and to scrape the bottom of the ground uh, of the sediment to bring in any organisms that are living in there since they're benthic, and also to scrape against the plants where some of the other species live, and then an identification sheet. And this is the process of dip netting. Not only is it valuable for getting water quality data, it is a lot of fun as well as you can see. And then once that's done, we're able to sort them in the pan. Um, and what we're looking for is a different species, again, we've said in different taxa. So the reason they're extremely valuable as a water quality subjects is because of their specific requirements for survival, whether that be that they require vegetation to forage on or they require oxygen. Um, a lot of people don't realize wetlands need oxygen for not only their macroinvertebrates, but also the fish to live in there. So dissolved oxygen content is an important part of water quality health. Um, and then some are actually very tall, are low, have a very low tolerance to toxic pollutants because of their external gills. And so we're going to talk a little bit more of those as we go. Um, speaking of some poor quality, um, these guys are very tolerant, is this midge larva. And so you would find these in an area that you have a um, high number of these with very little other species. And what's on the little finger that you see up in the top, that is the midge larva. And they actually are able to survive in low oxygen conditions because they actually float at the surface to breathe air. So they're made out of patients. Just like this rat-tailed maggot, he lays his aquatic larva in the water. Did you see the tail? That tail is actually his breathing tube that he can extend out of the water. So he's able and adapted to live in low oxygen situations because of his adaptation. All right, so another poll question. Dun, 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 dun. Which of the following is a method used by scientists to test the water health of our wetlands, streams, and lakes? So 
So select which one on the screen there that you think it is. Drinking the water, observing types of aquatic life and while dip netting, take the water home, boil it, or observing the color of the water. I should point out that the question said, what would scientists do? Oh, you guys are a smart bunch. This is great. Everyone got the right answer. It's by observing types of aquatic wildlife life in the system. So great job, everyone. All right, so the other thing that's really great about using macroinvertebrates is that they are relatively slow. If you've ever tried to catch a large fish in a net, um, you can tell fish are very fast and agile. It can escape us dip netting, but these guys are really slow, so even youths are able to do the sampling. And the other reason is they do tend to hang on the shorelines and sample at the bottom of the stream, so they're not moving very far. It's easy to get to, they're easy to collect. Um, yes, chemical tests can indicate water quality samples um, at a sample time. But with macroinvertebrates, since there is a life cycle and there are stages involved, they can actually tell you the health of that water system over the past several months. So you're not getting just a snapshot, you're actually getting a longer life of how long that system has been in either good health or poor health. Now, is it easy to do macroinvertebrates? Yes, for sampling. The tricky part comes to identifying them, and there are so many different keys out there. This is one key that you can find. It's free online from the University of Wisconsin. I believe Extension has produced it, um, and it breaks it down nicely for youth to use because it's based on very easy indicators that you can look at. Shell, no shell, how many legs does it have, how does it breathe, does it have wings, those kind of things. And from that, we can start to group the species into intolerant, facultative, and tolerant, meaning that organisms that can't adapt to poor environmental conditions um, will disappear from poor water quality and they're intolerant of pollution. Where on the other extreme size, they can tolerate, as we saw before with the maggot, um, poor water quality because of their adaptations. So we've actually created a sheet that's similar to this right here that we use on site that breaks them down into sensitive species, somewhat sensitive, and not sensitive. And these are species with those adaptations that can sort of float back and forth and um, find those out. Now this is one way to sample. There are other ways to sample the index of the biological integrity of the marsh system. This is actually a way professionals do the stream analysis to determine if it's a healthy wetland. And there's a series of metrics that we're going to go over that they use. Again, looking at the species, the first one is the number of kinds of leeches. Believe it or not, we do have freshwater leeches. I know that will freak many people out. Uh, leeches do not typically um, chase down humans in water systems to forage or to eat on, to blood, suck their blood. That would be a bad survival strategy, but they do actually eat other insects and sometimes amphibians as well, and some reptiles as well that they come across. But very few kinds will suck blood from mammals. And these are sort of sample of different types of leeches. But they, uh, a good number of leeches in your system could in indicate a um, healthy system. Another cool species that you may be familiar with is the water boatman. The ratio of water boatmen, these guys that you see here, to other true bugs and beetles in the sample um, are a good way to use as an indicator because this water boatman feeds on algae and dead things that tend to increase when polluted water systems. So if they're higher, then you may be leaning on the side that the water quality is a little bit poor. One of my favorites, I could spend a whole presentation on talking to you about dragonflies and damselflies, and we've mentioned them a little before. I wanna point out, this is a dragonfly a nymph on the, um, on the left, and you notice that thing protruding out sort of like an alien, that is actually his lower jaw. Uh, these guys are extremely good indicators of our wetlands. They tend to have much higher populations and healthier wetlands but they are also an important part of the wetland cycles. These guys are predatories at all stages, meaning that they actually will eat small minnows at this stage, 
Um, they go after many other insects. And then when they transition into their terrestrial phase as adults, they are also excellent at eating mosquitoes. Now, the interesting thing about the aquatic guys that we see here on the top right as the um, dragonfly nymph to the bottom is that, believe it or not, some species of dragonflies only live in the terrestrial phase flying around where we see them for two to five weeks. They may live in the aquatic stage for several years, and then when they emerge, they stay around very short periods of time. But again, you can see that they are sensitive to changes in the water flow, oxygen levels, and vegetation because they require the nymph level requires vegetation for them to sort of hang on. Now, here's some cool fun facts. Oh, and the damselfly as well. They have three external gills at the end of their abdomen, abdomen that helps them um, breathe oxygen through the water. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and but again, they're adapted to some changes to handle a little bit of pollutants, but they cannot tolerate very poor pollutants. Oh, we're going back. Don't anybody look at that. One of the mo the coolest things about these guys, I'm going to back up. I apologize for that. Is if you look at the bottom of the nymph phase on the back right, you don't see any webbed feet or anything on this. They actually push water through their posterior end, their end, their bottom basically to propel through the water. Now, we'll see if anyone's actually listening at this point because we have another poll question. What is the dragonfly nymph's primary mode of transportation through the water? Do they hitch a ride with a water boatman? <coughs> Do they swim doing the backstroke? They dive head first from the shore or shooting water out of their backside? Please take a moment to select. Awesome, everybody put your answers in. Dun, 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 dun. All right, great job. These guys do move, propel through the water, shooting water out their backside. Great job, everybody. And they actually lay their eggs on the stem of aquatic plants. So if the plants are removed from the system, which is also another indicator of a healthy system is having good aquatic vegetation, then these guys will be absent from the system because they have nowhere to lay their eggs. So another little cool thing. All right, this is the one species, another metric is looking at mayflies, caddis. Um, they're gill breathers. Um, external gill breathers and it allows them to take pollutants directly in from the water, which makes them very sensitive to pollution. Uh, these guys only occur in higher water quality or higher health sites. So they're a good species when you do get them in the dip net sampling that it tells you, hey, we're in a good water quality area. We don't often get them, unfortunately, but um, they are a good indicator for that. Here's sort of the Larva stage with the adult phase, the mayfly. And the larva stage has like a roach-like appearance. Um, those long tails in the back are important and their external gills come out along the back half of their abdomen in this species. Um, again, this is their presence means you have excellent water quality nearby. There are some people um, that live in parts of Polk County will probably recognize the lower right because when they do emerge, they tend to colonize in local areas on white walls. Um, the other thing that's cool is the fingernail clams are known for better water quality. This is actually a video that you're going to have a link to see later on. It shows how the fingernail clam removes um, the pollutants basically and the particles from the system. At the beginning of this video, these two aquariums are actually the same color. They both have the same water quality that's on the left side. But after running for a couple of days, um, you, you can see how the difference in the water quality just from having the fingernail clams in there. All right. We're going to guess, how does a snail breathe? So we'll see. We're going to test some knowledge on this one in our other poll question. So do a snail breathe similar to a predaceous diving beetle who gathers a bubble of water from the surface and carries underwater? They have internal gills like a fish. They have external gills like the mayfly larva. 
where they have lungs and they breathe from the surface, breathe air from the surface. Dun, 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 dun. I'm not giving you the answer on this. So this, this is all knowledge of you guys on this one. Put your answers in. Thank you everybody for selecting. This is gonna blow everyone's mind away at this point because the answer actually is they have lungs and they breathe air from the surface. So to demonstrate the coolness of this, I'm gonna share one video with you because we've got enough time that I can share a video with you if I get to it. All right, we are gonna hold on. The screen's gonna switch sides just real quick here. All right, here we go. So as I said, we have an aquatic snail. We have both native and invasive non-native aquatic snails in our wetlands. And as you see, that is his mouth extending upward. And not the antenna so much, but the piece coming out right there, he's gonna reach up all the way to the top. And he's actually gulping for air. So that's how they do it. One place you typically see the snails is on the bottom side of vegetation close to the top so that they're able to breathe. And so there we have it, that we have the snail video going right there. I want to say thank you very, very much, and I'm going to hand it back over to Shannon.